tonight has got to be one of my most favorite, the Feast of Tabernacles, the Festival of Tabernacles. Uh, it is also known as the Feast of Sukkot. It is also known as the Feast of Booths. All those are different translations of the, word, of the Hebrew word Sukkot. The O-T on the end makes it plural. If it's singular, it's sukkah. So sukkah is one, and the Sukkot is more than one. And what a, what a, another way to help you really understand what it is, think of tents uh, every year during the Feast of Tabernacles. And if you remembered last week, uh, one of the things that I had mentioned that I normally teach on the Feast of Tabernacles, but it, because it tied into Yom Kippur, uh, last week I talked about how one of the names of the Feast of Booths was also known as the Feast of the Nations. Do you remember that? On Yom Kippur, Israel was to make atonement for themselves. So five days later, as priests, they could make atonement for the 70 nations. That's why they slew 70 bulls during the Feast of Tabernacles. One bull for every nation. From the very beginning, God wanted to save the whole world and redeem them. And like I said last week, if the nations had only known, they wouldn't have destroyed the temple. They would have put armies around it to protect it. But isn't that like the devil to get the nations to destroy the very thing God is using to make atonement for them? Uh, so some of the other uh, names for it is also known as the Feast of Ingathering. But on your notes, we're going to start with Leviticus 23, 41 through 43. And here the Lord is, that whole chapter is the main chapter of all these festivals. But here now, toward the end of the chapter, it says, You shall keep a feast unto the Lord seven days in the year. Now, what does the word feast really mean? An appointment, an appointed time. Exactly. That's so important to remember that. When we hear feast, we think food. But that's in the Hebrew, the word is moed, and it literally means like God has a day timer, and he's setting a divine appointment with you. And then it says, it will be a statute forever in your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. Now, the number seven is very significant. And how many days were they to keep it? Seven days. So we have a seven-day feast in the seventh month. And it says, you shall dwell. Everyone say this with me. Dwell in booths. In booths. As we go over this. Seven days. All that are Israelites born shall what? Dwell in booths that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel to dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. Three times the Lord says they are to what? Dwell in booths. So do you think they got the hint? And the whole purpose of it was to remind them that they brought them out of the land of Egypt. Now here on your notes you have the Hebrew word sukkah, and it basically means a hut, a tabernacle, or a tent. As a matter of fact, here's a tent. In Genesis thirty-three seventeen, on your notes, uh, it says, Jacob journeyed to Sukkot and built him a house and made Sukkots. Actually, he just said Sukkot again in Hebrew, but they switched it to English. For his cattle, therefore the name of the place is called Sukkot. So the, the Sukkahs were also made for what? Cattle. So now the next verse is Leviticus 23, 2. And it says, speak unto the children of Israel and say to them, concerning the feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feasts. These are typical little uh, sukkahs or booths that they would build. We built one of these out on the property of where we meet. There's one out there right now. And uh, we used uh, four by fours, four four by fours and wooden lattice all the way around. And you interweave branches. Uh, there's a couple of palm stores that are in the area that we're trimming. We've got a bunch of Mediterranean palm branches. We stuck in them and everything. And then you have branches you lay across the top, and you're supposed to be able to see through the stars, you know, as you're looking above. And the, the whole theme of Sukkot is, and we're going to be talking about this in a little bit, is a temporary dwelling place. That is a tent, is a temporary dwelling place. And it was a, a time of great joy. And everyone would go out and eat. They'd have tables, and we lined ours with fruit, grapes and bananas and different things like this. Uh, and it's a lot of fun. So that gives you an idea of what the current-day modern sukkahs look like. And then uh, on your notes there, again, the word moed. It means an appointment or a fixed time. That's the Hebrew word for the word uh, feast. For example, here's a from the calendar October 2015 of uh, October. 
Uh, that's a fixed day, right? So God has fixed days on his calendar. We have one calendar and then God has a calendar. And we need to get back on God's calendar uh, so we can meet him. Uh, if we want an appointment with someone, you want to be on the same calendar. So now Deuteronomy 16:16. 16, 16. It says, three times in a year shall all your males appear before the Lord your God in the place which he shall choose. Okay, very important. In the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is also called Matzah, also in uh, the Feast of Shabbat or Weeks, and in the Feast of Sukkot, or Tabernacles, and that's Deuteronomy 16.16. 16. So how many times a year do they all have to be in Jerusalem? Three. For Passover? Pentecost and Tabernacles. A lot of people don't realize the Jews had kept Pentecost for 1,500 years before the Feast of Pentecost. They were commanded to. And right here's your reference. Uh, in uh, Exodus 23, again, it also says the same thing. It says, three times shall you keep a feast unto me in the year. Now, if you remember, a little pop quiz here. Passover, what were they harvesting? Barley. Barley. Pentecost in the summer, they're harvesting wheat. Now in the fall, what are they harvesting? It's the fruit harvest. The grapes, the pomegranates, the olives, and all of that kind of thing. So it says, three times you shall keep a, fe a feast unto me in the year. You'll keep the feast of, of unleavened bread and the feast of harvest, the first fruits of your labors which you've sown in the field, and the feast of ingathering. Okay, here now, instead of calling it Sukkot or Tabernacles, he calls it ingathering. You're gathering in. And it is at when? The end of the year. Did you notice that? See, their year ended right around October. See, that's why the Feast of Trumpets is their calendar year. Their January 1st is the Feast of Trumpets that we talked about earlier. When you've gathered in your labors out of the field, and then again, three times in the year all your males shall appear before the Lord. And that's the way to say Sukkot. This is the English version but it's celebrating the harvest. When you see this, what do you think of on our calendar? Thanksgiving was modeled after the Feast of Sukkot. That's what it was modeled after. The whole concept of Thanksgiving was thanking God for the bountiful harvest. Now, if you remember, it's called the Feast of Ingathering, and it's at the end of the year. Did you catch that? Now let's look at the book of Matthew. The Lord always would use, have backdrops of diff, whatever he's trying to teach. And he always was talking about the harvest. And look what he says now. The field is the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is what? The end of the world. And the reapers are the angels. Therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity. So he's likening the, the festivals to the different harvests. Right after Passover, there was a big harvest. If you remember in the teaching at Pentecost, 3,000 got saved, another big harvest. And now we see the harvest at the end of the age is tied into the fall festivals. Are you seeing that picture? In Revelation, now look at Revelation. We're going to tie this into Revelation now as well. Who are the reapers? And it says here, And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is what? It's ripe. And another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire, and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle, Gather the cluster of the vine of the earth for her what? Her grapes are fully ripe. Are you seeing the parallel of the, the grape harvest, the fruit harvest, and the timing? Passover happened during the spring. Pentecost happened during the summer. Prophetically, these events will happen in the fall. That's what this is telling you. These events are going to happen prophetically during this time of year. This is how you, if you're on God's calendar, you know, is this a, you ever have something happen and you wonder, is this a God thing or is it not? Is it just chance? God wants you to know this is a God thing. So he's telling you in advance, when these things happen, you will know. They will be literally tied into the festivals. And then it says, the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into what? The great wine press of the wrath of God. 
It's not going to be fun to be in that great wine press. But here's the thing I want to bring out. God's ultimate plan has always been to dwell or tabernacle among his people. Think about it. With Adam and Eve, he wanted to walk in the garden with them. And then after the first sin, they got kicked out. Okay, And he's always had a heart to come back and tabernacle with men. And so on the, if you remember, what happened on the first Passover? The very, very first Passover. Do you remember the story that came out of Egypt, the blood on the doorpost and all this? And, and then they go across the Red Sea. And then what happened on the very first Pentecost? They got the Torah on Mount Sinai. And if you remember, they had the sin of the golden calf, right? So Moses was up there for 40 days, came back down, had to deal with the golden calf situation, went back up for another 40 days. You got 80 days, another 10, probably in between 90 days, which is like three months. So what happens? Three months later, I taught you guys last week, he literally came down, letting them know that he had made atonement for them on the Day of Atonement. On Yom Kippur, he literally came down and saying, guess what, I've, we've made atonement, you guys get to live, you're not going to die. But what else happened? He also received the pattern how to make the tabernacle. And five days after Yom Kippur is the Feast of Tabernacles. So on the very first Feast of Tabernacles, they begin to build the tabernacle. That's when it was built. That's when it began to be built. We look at this in Exodus 35:20. It says, all the congregation of the children of Israel departed from the presence of Moses, and they came, every one whose heart stirred him up, and every one whom his spirit made willing. And they brought the Lord's offering to the work of the tabernacle of the congregation, and for all of his service, and for the holy garments. And they came, both men and women, as many as were willing-hearted, and brought bracelets and earrings and rings and tablets, all jewels of gold. And every man that offered, offered an offering of gold unto the Lord. And they did it willingly, didn't they? So they were full of uh, joy, and it's a time of rejoicing. I mean, guess what? We're not going to all die, too, you know, because of the sin of the golden calf. Well, here's what's amazing. The very first Feast of Tabernacles, they, God wanted to dwell with them, so he's tabernacling among men. Now look at what Zechariah 14 says. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, there's a good picture of the Mount of Olives also up on the screen, full of tombstones. Which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof. Now, has that happened yet? So this is yet to happen, isn't it, prophetically? When do you think that is going to happen? Well, let's look at what the Bible says. It shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations shall go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to do what? To keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And it shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even upon him shall be no rain. So any country that does not send a representative to come up and keep the Feast of Tabernacles during the millennial reign, that country will receive no rain. And then it goes on to say this. And if the family of Egypt go not up and come not, that have, that have no rain... Then they'll also get the plague, wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that don't come up to do what? Keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And this will be the punishment of Egypt and of the punishment of all the nations that don't come up to do what? Keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Three times. Do you realize they kept the Feast of Tabernacles in the past? We're going to be keeping the Feast of Tabernacles all during the millennial reign. It'd be a good idea to also be around for the dress rehearsals and to see what we're going to be doing during the Feast of Tabernacles. Now we see in Revelation 21, 3, and I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle, you catch that word? The tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and be their God. He returns on his feet, land on the Mount of Olives and he begins his millennial reign on the Feast of Tabernacles. And then 1,000 years later, the new Jerusalem descends on the Feast of Tabernacles, I mean, tabernacles with men. And you might be wondering, how come that big thing is there? Well, if you go down and read further in Revelation 21, it says the measure of the city is 12,000 furlongs by 12,000 furlongs, and the breadth and the length are the same as the height. That's 1,500 miles. So the new Jerusalem is going to be like from here to Kansas, square, 
and then 1,500 miles up in the air. That's what it says in Revelation. Go back and take a look. But the whole concept, like I was saying earlier, the concept of the Feast of Tabernacles is for us to realize that this earth and our bodies are only temporary dwelling places. And how many days did they keep the feast? And how many year, days with the Lord is this a year? A thousand years is one day. And 7,000 years, God is saying he has limited mankind to 7,000 years. This earth is temporary. Then you're going to get the new heavens and the new earth. It's all in the plan of God. This whole, this, in Isaiah 51, 6, let's just look at the next verse. It says, lift up your eyes to the heavens and look upon the earth beneath. For the heavens shall vanish away like smoke and the earth shall wax old like a garment and they that dwell therein shall die in like manner. It's all going to pass away. It's all temporary. And then also we look at 2 Corinthians 5.1. It says, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And that's exactly what you see in this picture. This, this body is temporary, but God has another house for us, eternal in the heavens. So the whole concept of the Feast of Tabernacles is for us to realize this is just temporary. As a matter of fact, the word tabernacle in the Greek, uh, the number is 4636 in your Strong's, it's skenos. And again, it means a hut or a temporary residence, the human body as the abode of the spirit. So do you see the, the similarities between the Feast of Tabernacles and this body being a tabernacle, a temporary dwelling place? As a matter of fact, look what John said in uh, chapter 2, verse 19. Jesus answered and said unto them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up what was he talking about his body as a matter of fact look at second second Peter 1 verse 13 and 14 Peter says this yea I think it meet as long as I am in this what tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance knowing that shortly I must put off this my what tabernacle even as the Lord Jesus Christ has showed me he realized that this tabernacle he's gonna have to put away but it's just temporary correct now here's what's very interesting. I'm going to show you something very exciting here that you may not have ever seen before or thought of in the scriptures until you understand this teaching. Look at who's saying this. In 2 Peter 1.16, Peter says, We have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. When was he eyewitnesses of that event? When did he see the coming and power of the Lord? The transfiguration. And do you know where that happened? Uh, Mount Tabor. Tabor, T-A-B-O-R. And now let's look at Mark 9. Now look at this. It says, the Lord is speaking, and he said to them, Verily I say unto you that there be some of them that standing here which shall not taste of death till they have seen the kingdom of God, what? Come with power. And then it says, After six days Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, and led them up to a high mountain apart, by themselves and he was transfigured before them and Peter answered now remember the little huts that they built and do you remember when I just showed you in Zechariah the Lord is coming back around the feast of what tabernacles and Peter just saw the kingdom of God come with power Peter answered and said Jesus master it's good for us to be here let us build three sukkahs let's build three tabernacles one for you and Moses and Elijah he saw it was at the Feast of Tabernacles. And he said, let's build three tabernacles. That's right. That event, he saw the kingdom of God was coming on the Feast of Tabernacles. And he says, okay, let's build three sukkahs right now. That's, when they said tabernacles, this is what he was thinking of. Now, Leviticus 23. It's here also in the 15th day of the seventh month, when you've gathered in the fruit you shall keep a feast unto the Lord seven days. The first day shall be a Sabbath. So even if it fell on a Tuesday or a Wednesday, it would be a Sabbath. The first day was to be a Sabbath, and the eighth day was to be a Sabbath. And isn't that interesting? If it's seven days long, how can you have an eighth day? Did any of you catch that? Well, it's a very important eighth day. We'll talk about that later. It's actually a separate feast, but it's hooked onto it. Just like Passover is separate from a seven-day feast of unleavened bread, Passover is one day, hooked onto a seven-day feast of unleavened bread. They're like bookends, Passover and the eighth day of Sukkot. You have a seven-day feast followed at the end by a one-day feast, but they're hooked together, and you're going to see why in a minute. 
But this is what it says. It says, you shall take for yourselves on the first day the boughs of goodly trees, branches of palm trees, the boughs of thick trees, and willows of the brook, and you shall what? Rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. You're commanded to rejoice. As of sunset last night for the next seven days, if you're a child of God, there is to be no whiny whinies, no sour pusses, no sour grapes. For the next seven days, all of us, just like you know, a little kid, the parents say, you know, you know, they're pouting. You smile. And they kind of have a little slight smile. You know, and you better smile. They kind of finally, they start grinning. You know. Well, that's what God is telling to us. These next seven days, you smile for seven days. You have to be happy. You have to rejoice. It's just the first day and the eighth day. I want to speak to you a moment about the symbolism of the four species. I had them flown in from Israel. We have the palm branch, the willow, the myrtle, and this is an etrog. And as you see in the pictures all over in Jerusalem, they were having these. As a matter of fact, during the Lord's time, this is what they were having and waving. And there's a funny, very funny story historically that was written over 2,000 years ago. One of the high priests, like I told you last week, many of the high priests were very wicked. They were appointed by Herod, and they got that position through bribery and treachery. And even before Christ was born, there is a story in the Talmud where one of the high priests, he did not like the water libation ceremony that I'm going to be telling you about a little bit later. And like I said, what Josephus recorded, two and a half million Jews would be at the festivals for these feasts. Two and a half million people. And they're all having etrogs and lulavs, is what this is called. And they're rejoicing. And this high priest, instead of pouring the water upon the altar, he dumped it on the ground. All of a sudden, about 10,000 etrogs are being hurled at the high priest, just beating him to a pulp. It caused a huge commotion. The Roman soldiers come swarming in the temple. Thousands of Jews were killed in the temple. But it was all because of this one high priest not following along. And then they start throwing these at the Roman soldiers and at the high priest, and quite a riot broke out. But I want to tell you about this a little bit. I have here on the notes... Uh, the etrog, uh, as far as from a messianic perspective, symbolizes the Lord's beauty. Uh, the lulav, which is another name for the palm branch. If you look at Psalms 92.12, it talks about the righteous shall be as a palm tree. And so it speaks of righteousness. Uh, his righteousness is power to save. Uh, the myrtle is, represents praise and rejoicing. That's here. And then the willow it represents his humility as the suffering servant. Now what I have here, this is, I didn't make copies of this for any of you. I wasn't sure if you'd wanted it, but this talks about the four species and the blessing that's supposed to be done over it. And believe it or not, since we are actually in the Feast of Tabernacles, I'm going to go through the little thing that they do and say the blessing over it. Uh, what you're supposed to do is take the lulav in your right hand and then you take the etrog and you hold it down and then a little bit, I'm going to turn it the other direction and put it together. But they're first, they're held separately. Here's the two blessings, and then I'm going to do the wave offering. It's a wave offering that they do. Uh, the first blessing is, Baruch Ata Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Kitshanu B'Mitzvotah, Vitzivanu Al Nedlat Lulav, which translates, Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with commandments and has commanded us concerning the taking of the palm branch. And what they would do, Okay, I'm turning around a little bit. That's east, isn't it? After the blessing, they turn it over, and they hold them together, and they wave them three times facing the east, like this. And then they go to the next direction, and the next direction, and then they turn back around, and then they wave it up, and then they wave it down. And the purpose of this is to show how God is king of the entire universe, the north, the south, the east, the west, the heavens above and down but they would all be rejoicing in Jerusalem and different places around. Uh, many people have those, and they just uh, rejoice. Now, here's the other thing. Are you seeing some key, thing, key events happening on these feasts? Do you see why they're appointed times? On the Feast of Tabernacles, that's when the tabernacle began to be built. On uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, you see, is when the Lord will begin his millennial reign. Let's look at and see if there's any other key events that may have happened as well on the Feast of Tabernacles. This is... Solomon's temple. Many of you have seen, uh, you know, little things of Herod's temple models, but this was Solomon's temple. 
Now it's about you know a thousand years before Herod's temple. And let's look at when it was de- dedicated. In Second Chronicles five, it says, "And all the work that Solomon made for the house of the Lord was what finished." And all the men of Israel gathered themselves to the king in the feast that's in the what? Seventh month. And it happened, and look at what happened, it says. As the priest came out of the holy place, for all the priests present were sanctified and did not wait by division. Listen to how they rejoiced. Remember they were commanded to rejoice? It says, the Levitical singers, all of them, of Asaph, of Heman, of Jeduthun, with their sons and their brothers, They were all clothed in white linen. They had cymbals and harps and lyres, and they stood at the east end of the altar. And with them were 120 priests sounding with trumpets. And they were as one to the trumpeters and to the singers. Remember in Acts when they're all in one accord in one place, worshiping and praising God? Here they're all together. And it says, as they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and the cymbals and the instruments of music and praised the Lord, saying, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. The house was filled with a cloud, the house of the Lord, so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. This was at the Feast of Tabernacles is when the Holy Spirit came down on Solomon's temple at the dedication. It was the Feast of Tabernacles. We see it goes on in 2 Chronicles 7 that when Solomon made an end of praying, the fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the evening sacrifices. And the glory of the Lord filled the house, and the priest could not enter into the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. And in the what day? The A day, they made a solemn assembly. They kept the dedication of the altar seven days and the feast seven days. They're specifically talking about the Feast of Tabernacles is when that event happened. Now, here's the thing to remember, too. The celebrations in the temple, like I said, over two million people would come. Uh, When I talked about the spring feast, Josephus recorded over 250,000 lambs were killed in one day for Passover. All the pilgrims who arrived in Jerusalem at the temple's courtyard came to do what? Rejoice especially during this feast. And the focus of this rejoicing was the ceremony surrounding the commandment to pour water on the altar, the water libation that I was telling you about. The sages of Israel testified to the celebrations of the water libation from the days of the second temple, describing the what? The great joy of the ceremony. They were commanded to rejoice and they partied. If you guys think you guys have parties, or if you think God is boring, you have have no idea what he really is like. Whoever has not seen the celebration of the libation has never experienced the feeling of true joy. In the court of the women, that's the court of the women you see in the picture, there were four enormous candlesticks with four golden bowls at the top of each. These were over seven and a half stories high. These were 75 feet high. And there were four golden bowls at the top of each. Now here's what I want you to notice. What they used for wicks, the linen garments of the priests, they cut them into strips. The worn out liturgical garments of the priests, they would cut them into strips, and that is what they used for wicks. And they would pour in oil from seven gallon buckets. Do you see the, like the ladder going up here? See that little ladder? You're going to get a closer view here. Uh, Four young priests in training would climb to the top, carrying immense oil jugs with which they would fill the bowls. Once lighted, there was not a courtyard in all of Jerusalem that did not glow with the light that emanated from the celebrations in the temple courtyard. So during the Feast of Tabernacles, now imagine, they had no electricity. Jerusalem sits very high. And so here is way up on a mountain. And if you're at the Mediterranean Sea even, 20, 30 miles away, 40 miles away, you're going to be able to see these lights at night, aren't you? Jerusalem, during the Feast of Tabernacles, was known as the light of the world. Can you see why? Do you know it was in John chapter 8, during the Feast of Tabernacles, when the Lord spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Go back and look. You will see it was at the Feast of Tabernacles when this event happened. But I think that's so exciting. Now when you read that in John chapter 8, where he says, I am the light of the world, you know literally what was going on in the temple. Now, this is the women's court. This is Herod's temple. Here's the women's court. You notice these little uh, runways here where people could stand? There's steps you're going to get a closer look at here. 
these 15 steps, uh, they would lead up from the women's court to the Nicanor Gate and uh, go on through to the court of Israel, where they slaughtered all the animals. And these 15 steps that they had, they made 15 steps purposely. And they would correspond to the 15 chapters of the Songs of Ascent in the book of Psalms, which are said by King David at the time he dug the foundations for the temple. The Psalms were their hymn book. The Psalms of Ascent are Psalms 120 through Psalms 134. Because if you remember, the city of David was down the southern hill, and they literally would ascend to the temple. And while they are ascending to the temple, they would be singing and chanting all these particular psalms. There's the Hallel. I don't know if you remember me mentioning about that. Where we get the word hallelujah from. These are Psalms 113 through Psalms 118. But what's very interesting is the Hallel, they would always sing during the festivals. If you go to this website, this is not a messianic website. This is an orthodox Jewish website who want nothing to do with Jesus or the Messiah. But I want you to see what the orthodox Jews believe about these particular psalms. And there's a lot of other good stuff on there. These chapters are expressions of joy and faith in God and of gratitude for salvation from our enemies. They were incorporated into the book of Psalms by King David and they were singled out for inclusion in Hallel because they contain the following fundamental themes of the faith of Judaism. Okay, now I want you to notice what it says here. The Exodus, you're going to see that's very significant. The giving of the Torah by God at Sinai. The future resurrection of the dead and the coming of the Messiah. So they believe Psalms 113 through Psalms 118 speak about the coming of the Messiah. So if you remember, they would sing Psalms 118 at the festivals. Then as the people sang, the men would dance before them while juggling flaming torches. You thought the Puyallup Fair was fun. You should have been here for this. The Levites, standing on the 15 steps that ascend from the women's court to the court of Israel, played on lyres, harps, trumpets, and many other instruments. So they're just a huge, you know, wonderful time. Well, you see, there'd be two priests. They would be blowing silver trumpets. They stood at the top of the stairs on either side of the entrance to the great gate of the court. All this was done to honor the commandment of the water libation. And this is based on the Mishnah. Uh, men and women and children participated in the immense joy of the water libation. Some directly while others stood and watched. Special elevated balconies were constructed to enable the women of Israel to watch the men as the Sanhedrin as they danced. So those were those balconies I showed you. And those are the, the big you know, golden bulls, and the priests are all there singing, and everyone's dancing and rejoicing. Sounds like they were having fun, huh? I mean, you guys thought you knew how to party. Listen to this. This one rabbi said, during the days of the water libation ceremony, we barely got to sleep at all. The first hour of the day saw us attending to the daily sacrifices. Following this, we were engaged in prayer. Afterwards, the additional offering. Then we ate, and it already became time to attend to the afternoon service. And this was followed by the celebration of the festival of the water libation, which lasted the entire night. And then we would begin again. So these people knew how to party during this festival. I want you to really get the idea of rejoicing. Are you picking that up? And what a fun time this is. Well, I want to talk to you for a minute about the daily ceremony. The priests were divided into three groups. In Chronicles, we're going to look at this verse in a little bit, David divided the priesthood into 24 divisions. And 24 divided by 3 is what? 8. They took three groups of 8 priests. One group was responsible back in this area. See the altar there? That they would, the big ramp? That's where they, here's the Nicanor Gate, the court of the women, and they go through there, they'd slay the sacrifices, burn them up the altar, go into the holy place, and the most holy place was back here. But if you remember, last week when I talked about the Feast of the Nations, they'd have these 70 bulls they'd be killing. They also have all the daily offerings that they would have to do. They'd also have other people's offerings, the Thanksgiving offerings, the peace offerings. So there would be, I mean, thousands of priests would be there to help during the festivals. And now the second group... This is what's really interesting. They would go out, uh, they would be headed by the high priest. They went out the water gate to the pool of Siloam because it had living water. Uh, It says here, um, through this gate, a flask of water from the pool of Siloam was brought back into the temple to be used for the water libation which took place on the altar during the Sukkot holiday. And here's the pool of Siloam was down here. Now, this did not exist. That is the golden Muslim Dome of the Rock. 
But here was the city of David, and they would come this far, give you an idea how far they'd come down to the pool of Siloam. But that's about where the temple stood. And they'd go out the water gate, which is on the south side, and they'd come all the way down to the pool of Siloam and go all the way back up. But there'd be, there was two and a half million people here. There'd be hundreds of thousands of pilgrims uh, all watching this big parade of priests coming down to get the living water. What's interesting, the assistant had a silver pitcher full of wine. And at dawn, the assembly proceeded with melody and song to the spring of Siloam at the foot of the walls of Jerusalem. And the pool of Siloam means gently flowing waters. That's what it means. Take a look at this next little nice golden flask that was used for the water libation. Uh, There was a silver cup with a golden flask is used in the festival of the water libation which takes place during the holiday of Sukkot. At dawn, the priests and the Levites, accompanied by the throngs of participants, wind their way down to the spring of uh, Siloam. Water's drawn from the spring and carried up the temple in the golden flask where it's poured into the silver cup as it rests atop the altar. On that one big brazen altar, there'd be a silver cup they would pour the living water in. There the high priest had a golden vase and drew the water known as the living waters, or in Hebrew it's Mayim Hayim. And he held it in the vase, and his assistant held a silver vase containing wine. Now what does silver speak of in the Bible? Redemption. Silver is redemption. And it contains what? The wine, the blood of the grapes, symbolizing blood. So here you have the high priest. He took the special golden decanter and filled it with the living water. Then the congregation ascended again to the temple, led by the high priest who bore the golden vessel, which speaks of royalty. Arriving at the temple, he would bring the decanter up to the altar and he would pour the water into the silver cup at its corner while another priest is pouring out the wine. Do you see the wine, the water, and the blood being poured out on the altar? And Yeshua, what poured out of him? The water and the blood. And so here, right at the altar of the sacrifice, you have the water and the blood that's being poured out over the sacrifice. And another priest who poured out the wine from another decanter into the cup at the opposite corner. And this ceremony is connected to the rainfall of the coming year. And it was accompanied by yearning and prayers for blessing on the earth and its produce. Because what happens if you don't get rain? Your crops are destroyed. They did not have Safeway and Albertsons back then. So they had to have rain. And so this is the time of year. They just ended the summer drought, basically. They've reaped their harvest, and now they're praying for the winter rains so that they'll have a good spring uh, harvest. This is, and remember the, the Hallel spoke of the Exodus, they said? In Exodus 15, 1 and 2, it says, Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord, and spoke, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously, the horse and rider thrown into the sea. Remember that song? Then it says this, the Lord is my strength and my song, and he is become my what? And what's the Hebrew word for salvation? Yeshua. And what was the Lord's name? Mary didn't know English. Okay, so he didn't say Jesus. He said Yeshua, which means salvation. He is my God, and I will prepare him a what? A habitation, a sukkah, a tabernacle, a dwelling place. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. Well, look at Psalms 118. This is what they're singing because it spoke of the Exodus. The Lord is my strength and song and is become my salvation. Do you see that? They took that directly from there. But look at the next verse. The voice of what? Rejoicing. Do you see why they would sing that during the Feast of Tabernacles? What are they commanded to do? And salvation is in the what? Tabernacles of the righteous the right hand of the lord does valiantly does not yeshua sit at the right hand of the father and did not he do valiantly so here you see rejoicing and salvation in the feast of tabernacles do you see how this all tied together it's not only exodus but it's also tabernacles and it also speaks of the coming of the messiah at the feast of tabernacles the seventh day the last day of the feast they would be singing isaiah 12 2 and 3 because look what it says Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also is become my salvation. Now look at these next words here. Out of Isaiah. Therefore with joy shall you draw water out of the wells of Yeshua. Now go and read John chapter 7. 
in the Gospels, it says, now the Jews' feast of what was at hand? About the midst of the feast, Jesus went up to the temple and taught. The last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood up, cried, sang. They had just got done singing. With joy shall you draw waters from the wells of salvation. And it was at that moment that the Lord interrupted and said, yes, he that believes on me. As the scripture says, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. They just got done saying, but Joyce, you draw waters from the wells of Yeshua. And Yeshua stood up and said, yes, he who believes on me, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. So now when you read John chapter 7, you know what events were going on in the tabernacle as he cried that out. Not only about you, but that's kind of exciting. So one group is slaying all the sacrifices. The other group had gone down to the pool of Siloam and back up. What was the third group doing? The third group went out the eastern gate, which is also known as the beautiful gate. They went down to the Motsam Valley and they cut willow branches that were 25 to 30 feet in length. Huge long willow branches. And then like a parade, they would form rows and rows of priests 30 feet apart waving branches because they don't want to hit each other in the head. Okay, so there's rows and rows and rows of priests, like a parade, and they're all in just perfect unison, and they'd have these big 30-foot willow branches, and they'd take a step, and they'd wave them and bring it back up, and they'd take a step, and they'd wave them and bring it back up. So can you imagine thousands of willow branches waving in the wind? Can you hear it? Do you know what the Hebrew word for wind is? It's ruach, which is also translated spirit. So here you have the living water coming up to the temple because they would march in unison. The same time the high priest was coming up with the living water to the temple, the other priests were coming with the spirit toward the temple. Now, this gets gooder and gooder. At the same time, both groups, one with the wind and the water, would march back to the temple, which was to be symbolic of the spirit coming upon Jerusalem. When they arrived at the gates, there was a priest who was playing a flute, and the flute is pierced. So the priest, who was known as the pierced one, was calling for the wind and the water to enter the temple. Think about that one for a minute. Now, Leviticus. Let's go back and take a look. Because it was, how many days long was the Feast of Tabernacles? And then there was the what? The eighth day. Okay, it says in Leviticus 23, seven days you shall offer a fire offering to the Lord. On the eighth day shall be a holy convocation. And what is convocation, remember? Mikra? Dress rehearsal? Dress rehearsal? Or an assembly? It literally means an assembly, but it also can mean to rehearse, to rehearse something. And then it says, and you shall offer a fire offering to the Lord. It's to be a solemn assembly and you shall do no work of labor. The eighth day is known as Shemini Atzeret. And so uh, where they get the word Shemini Atzeret from, uh, you'll notice on your notes, Shemini is the word for the number eight, and it's the eighth day. And they were to have a solemn assembly. Well, Atzeret means assembly. So Shemini Atzeret literally means eighth assembly, or the assembly on the eighth day. Now, the number seven being the perfect number signifies a complete unit as each week ends with the seventh day called the Shabbat. Literally, it's like, it comes from the number seven, Sheva, in Shabbat. Now, the eighth day becomes also the first day, right? Like, do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, what? Do, goes right back to the beginning again. I mean, everything is marked with this unit of seven. And then eight is not only the eighth day, but in a, of a week, it becomes the first day as well. Well, that speaks of new beginnings. You're starting over again. And remember I told you about the 7,000-year plan of God, and then you have the eighth day, and it's the new heavens and the new earth and new beginnings. We see here in 2 Peter 2.13, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. It was known as uh, Simchat Torah. That's a, the eighth day, as well as being Shemini Atzeret, was also known as Simchat Torah, which literally means rejoicing. 
the same theme. Rejoicing in the word of God. Shouldn't we rejoice that we have the word of God today? Well, look at what it says in Deuteronomy 31. It says, Moses commanded them, saying, at the end of every seven years. Now, remember, the Feast of Tabernacles is seven days long, and it's in the seventh month, and then at the end of every seven years, it says, in the solemnity of the year of release, in the Feast of what? Tabernacles. So again, this is also tied to the Feast of Tabernacles. When all Israel is come to appear before the Lord your God in the place which he shall choose. Now, if you remember, only the males 20 years old and upward had to come to the Feast of Tabernacles. Remember reading that? But in the seventh year, everybody had to come, not just the men. It says, and you shall read this Torah. The word law is a horrible English translation. The Hebrew word is Torah, and the real translation is teaching. It literally means to teach. And in other words, they shall read this teaching before all of Israel in their hearing. And though, so it says, gather the people together, men and women, children, your stranger that is within your gates, that they may hear, that they may learn, and fear the Lord your God, and observe to do all the words of this Torah. And then look what Isaiah 2 says, prophesying about these last days. And in Zechariah 14, during the Feast of Tabernacles, when the Lord comes back. See, I believe that will happen in the year of Jubilee. And seven times seven is what? 49. And so at the end of that 49th year, I believe it'll be right then, the Lord returns to begin the year of Jubilee. And so what is he going to do? It says it'll come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains, and he will be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow to it. Remember Tabernacles, the Feast of Nations? And many people shall go and say, Come ye, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jesus. And who will teach us? The Messiah will teach us his ways, and we will walk in his paths, for out of Jerusalem or Zion shall go forth what? The Torah. And the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. The Lord is going to be teaching us Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy from his perspective when he returns. Because it's so misused and misapplied. He will judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks, and nations shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war anymore. O house of Jacob, come ye and let us walk in the light Remember, Feast of Tabernacles, light of the Lord. Micah says the same thing. He prophesies. In the last days it will come to pass. The, mountain of the house of the Lord will be established in the top of the mountains, and it will come be exalted above the hills. The people shall flow to it, and many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways. We will walk in his paths for the Torah. We'll go out of Zion in the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. We're all going to be sitting at Messiah's feet when he returns to the Feast of Tabernacles. All of the saints are going to gather around and sit at his feet, and he's going to teach us his ways. Now look at Nehemiah. Nehemiah is about 400 years after Solomon's temple. Solomon's temple was roughly 1,000 B.C. Uh, the Babylonian captivity, the temple was destroyed about 587 B.C., 70-year captivity in Babylon. It's around 500 B.C., 480. They come back, they're going to rebuild the temple. And after 70 years, a lot of them had never had a Torah scroll. They weren't rich enough, and they, weren't, they didn't have the Torah. And so it says here in Nehemiah 8, And all the people gathered themselves together as one man. Ooh, that's always a good sign when we're one, isn't it? Into the street that was before the which gate? Ah, the water gate. Now, I'm not talking about Nixon here. <laughs> and they spoke unto Ezra the scribe to bring What? The book of the Torah of Moses was the Lord that commanded Israel. And Ezra, the priest, brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. Now, does that ring a bell to anybody? What happens on the first day of the seventh month? Feast of Trumpets. The first day. See, now you're learning this stuff. When you read in the scripture, you know what they're, what's really going on. The Feast of Trumpets is the first day of the month. What's the tenth day of the seventh month? Yom Kippur. And what's the fifteenth day of the seventh month? The Feast of Tabernacles. They're all located in the seventh month. Uh, Tishri 1, 
they don't have September, October. It's Tishri. Tishri 1 is the Feast of Trumpets. Tishri 10 is Yom Kippur. Tishri 15 is the Feast of Tabernacles. You find all of that information in Leviticus 23. That's your, that's your main text to get the dates, which is why you want to get a Hebrew calendar. If you want to get a Hebrew calendar, here's the best website to go to, because I've sold out of mine. The, T-H-E, Gal- Galilee, like the Sea of Galilee, Galilee Experience, the Galilee Experience, dot com. Uh, they're in Israel. I was there in Israel with Vicky last November. We were at the Galilee Experience. It's a great store. They're right on the Sea of Galilee, and they ship out uh, messianic calendars of the Holy Land. Yeah, lots of good music. And so anyway, back to the, this verse. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning till midday before the men, the women, and those that could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. So they read in the book of the law of God distinctly, giving it the sense and caused them to understand the reading. What good does it do if you don't understand what you're reading? And now, how, the Feast of Trumpets, when I spoke on it, how many days long is it? It's two days, but it's known as one long day. It's the feast where no one knew the day or the hour it was going to begin, Remember? And so it says that on the second day, that tells you it's the second day of the Feast of Trumpets, were gathered together the chief of the fathers of all the people, the priests, the Levites, unto Ezra the scribe, even to understand the words of the Torah. And they found written in the law, which the Lord had commanded by Moses, that the children of Israel should what? Dwell in booths in the Feast of the Seventh Month. They didn't realize that because they hadn't done it for 70 years in the captivity and they didn't have a Torah scroll. And then it says, and they should publish and proclaim in all their cities and in Jerusalem, saying, go forth to the mount and fetch olive branches and pine branches and myrtle branches and palm branches, branches of thick trees to make booze. They would literally use those to make their booze, as it is written. Also, day by day, from the first day to the last day, he read in the book of the law of God, and they kept the feast seven days. And on the eighth day was a solemn assembly according to the manner. Do you see that? What other thing happens on the eighth day in Judaism? Circumcision? That's right. There's some very important tie-in you're going to see here. Is God a God of chaos? Or is he a God of order? And when he does things, he does things for a reason. I think it's Isaiah 55. He says, my word will not return void until it accomplishes that which I sent it. So think about this. There's something to do with this seven-day feast. The feast is what? Seven days? Then there's the eighth day. And circumcision is on the eighth day. Sukkot was given to us by God to instruct us what life would be like during the Messianic age when the knowledge of the Messiah and the Spirit of God will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Shemini Atzeret and Simchat Torah was to be a day of rejoicing in the Torah. The seven-day feast of unleavened bread is linked to the one-day feast of Pentecost also, at the giving of the Torah, then you have the seven-day feast of tabernacles linked by the one-day feast of rejoicing in the Torah. So they were to rejoice in the Torah. And in Deuteronomy 33, what do we find? He said, The Lord came from Sinai and rose up from Seir unto them. He shined forth from Mount Paran, and he came with ten thousands of saints. From his right hand went a fiery law for them. Yea, he loved the people. All his saints are in your hand. And look what it says here. They sat down at your feet. Everyone shall receive of your words. So can you see like little birds or little kids? We're all going to sit down at his feet and he's going to teach us. And then it says, Moses commanded us a law, even the inheritance of the congregation of Jacob. Now the word Torah in the Strong's from 3384. So it comes from the word Yara and it means to flow as water, to rain to point out as if by aiming the finger to teach. So when you see Torah, I want you to think of what? Rain. And what are they praying for? Rain. And water is compared to the Torah. It descends from a high place to a low place. They both came from heaven. They both go to earth. They both bring blessing. They both bring life. You can see why the Torah is compared to water. And during Sukkot, they're praying for what? Water, and during Sukkot is when the Torah is going to be shared. 
In Ezekiel 34, 26, it says, I will make them and the places around about my hill a blessing, and I will cause the shower to come down in his season, and there shall be showers of what? See? It's not just water, it's blessing. He's equating rain to blessing. And then look at Psalm 72. He shall come down like the rain. He. Do you see that? He comes down like the what? On the mown grass, like showers that water the earth. In his days the righteous shall flourish and abundance of peace until the moon is not. He also shall have rule from sea to sea and from river to the ends of the earth. This is speaking of the messianic age and he will come down like rain. And we see it's at the Feast of Tabernacles, didn't we? It says in Habakkuk 2.14, The earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. It's a lot of water I see on that earth. Hosea 6.3 says, Then shall we know, if we follow on to know the Lord, his going forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come to us as what? As the rain, as the latter and the former rain into the earth. Joel 2.3, be glad therefore, sons of Zion, and do what? Rejoice in the Lord your God. He has given you the former rain according to righteousness. He will cause the rain to come down for you, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. Here's the, the Messiah, and you see a Torah scroll, and the Hebrew letters falling as rain, because Yeshua is the Torah. So you can just see him, the words of the Torah. He's the living Torah, falling down, raining upon heaven. Deuteronomy 32, 2. My doctrine shall drop as the rain, my speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb, as the showers upon the grass. How many of you know we want water? But do you want it like Hurricane Katrina? Or do you want it like the gentle falling on the herbs and on the small grass? That's how he comes. He doesn't come like the hurricane. He wants to come to us to teach us like that. Uh, uh, there's this one rabbi, he felt that the drops of water eventually boring through a rock intimated that the Torah would eventually even penetrate his hard heart. And he used to say that a Jew without Torah is like a fish without water. And that's how we need to feel about the Torah. All too often we feel like the Torah has been done away with, it's discarded, that's old, we have new. We don't realize the Torah is still alive because God's word will not return void. Song of Solomon is the most misunderstood book in the entire Bible. It's not about what everyone thinks it's about. It's about the festivals. And I want you to watch this for a minute. First off, uh, chapter 2, verse 10 and 11. She is speaking about him, and she says, My beloved spoke, and this is what he said. And he's speaking, and he says, Get up. <laughs> okay? Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. For lo, the winter is past. The what is over and gone? She didn't just sleep for one night. He says, the winter's past. He says, girl, you went into hibernation. You slept all winter. You missed all the blessings. You missed all the rain. You're in the church. You don't want to work the harvest. You want to just stay here and be blessed by me, but you don't want to go out and work for me in the fields. As a matter of fact, I mean, he has this most beautiful thing he says, you know, for the sound of the turtle dove is heard in the land. You know, he has this beautiful discourse. He's outside looking through the window saying, get up, honey, come on, let's go work. And look what she says. My beloved is mine, and I am his. In other words, you belong to me first, and then I belong to you, Lord. She doesn't say I belong to him and he belongs to me. It's you belong to me first, Lord. I got Jesus in my pocket, and I'll pull him out when I need him. And then I belong to you. She goes, he feeds among the lilies. And then look what she says to him. Until the day break and the shadows flee away, turn my beloved and be like a roe or a young heart upon the mountains of Bether. The word Bether there in Hebrew means separation. It's like the cascades. She says, why don't you go run and play on the other side of the cascades and you come back when I call you. You go work the harvest. I'll let you know when I need you, is what she was saying. And so we see in chapter 3, verse 1, all of a sudden, by night on my bed I sought him. Isn't how we often seek the Lord? Only at night, on our bed, ready to fall asleep. Okay, Lord, how you doing? Good night, you know. I can just see her reaching her hand, trying to see if he's there. By night, on my bed, I sought him. Where are you, honey? You didn't come home. And so she says, I sought him whom I so loved. I sought him, but I did not find him. And she says, now I'm going to get up. She should have got up earlier, but she says, now I'm going to get up. I'm going to go about the city in the streets and in the what ways? 
Broad is the way of destruction. The broad way. She says, I will seek him whom my soul loves. I sought him, but I did not find him. She professed a love for him, but she did not want to really work for him. It was just all emotions, no content. In Hosea 5, 6, it says, They shall go with their flocks and with their herds to seek the Lord, but they shall not find him. He hath withdrawn himself from them. That's what happens. You see it with the church oftentimes. Revelation 3, the, the verse, Laodicean church, I stand at the door and knock. If any man comes, opens the door. He's not knocking at the door of the unbeliever. He's knocking at the door of the church. They don't even know he's outside. They tell the Lord, leave us alone. We're having church. He's out there knocking. Hey, anybody there? Come out here. Jeremiah seven thirteen. And now, because you've done all these works, saith the Lord, and I spoke unto you, rising up early and speaking, but you heard not, and I called you, but you answered not. Jeremiah twenty nine thirteen says, You shall seek me and find me when you search for me with what? All your heart. And then later on in the Song of Solomon, the same thing. She says, I sleep. Well, the problem with the English here, there's different, we put our dog to sleep and we go to sleep. But I think there's two different sleeps there. Okay? Well, the word sleep here in Hebrew means at the point of death. This isn't just having a good night's sleep. She says, but my heart's still ticking. Okay, my heart's kind of awakes. My heart still ticks. And then she hears the voice of her beloved that knocketh. Well, the word in the Hebrew knock doesn't mean rap. It means to beat severely like he's pounding on the door. It's almost like he's trying to do CPR to wake her up. And what does he say this time? Instead of saying rise up, this time he says, open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my undefiled, for my head is filled with what? And my locks with what? It's pouring down rain. But he doesn't want to go in. He wants her to come out and enjoy the rain and enjoy the blessings of God. But this time, what does she say? Oh, I've taken off my coat. You want me to put it back on? I've washed my feet. You want me to get my feet dirty? She doesn't want to go work the harvest. She says, my beloved put his hand by the hole of the door. Oh, my bowels were moved for him. She has all this love and emotion. But again, there's, no, there's no, uh, nothing solid there. Then she says, my beloved put his, in his hand by the hole of the door, uh, and my bowels are moved for him. I rose up to open to my beloved, but I had to stop and take the time to anoint my hands with myrrh and my fingers with sweet-smelling myrrh upon the handles of the lock. She not only had it shut, she had the door barred so no one could come in. And then she opened to her beloved. But my beloved had withdrawn himself and was gone. My soul filled when he spoke. I sought him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he gave no answer. She was not eagerly expecting his return, looking out the window, waiting for her Messiah to come or her king to come. She was in bed sleeping. Had the door. She not only didn't want to go work the harvest, she didn't want anyone to come and ask any request of her either. So let's take a look at the next verse in uh, Proverbs. It says, Turn at my warning. Behold, I will pour out my spirit to you. I will make my words known to you. Because I've called and you refused. I stretched out my hand and no one paid attention. But you've despised all my advice and would have none of my warning. I will also laugh at your trouble. I will mock when your fear comes. When your fear comes as a wasting away and your ruin comes like a tempest. When trouble and pain come upon you, then you shall call upon me and I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. The point is, we need to open when he knocks. We need to be quick to respond to when the Lord is speaking to our hearts. Amen? Isaiah 55 says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. To call you upon him while he is near. Look at Hosea 10, 12. Sow yourselves in righteousness. Reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he comes and rains what? Righteousness upon you. The, the rain speaks of blessings and righteousness, but we have to break up this fallow ground of our heart. Now, if you remember in John 7, 37, the last day, the great day of the feast, when he stood up and he cried out, you know, if any man thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Remember that we just read? Right after he said that, look what, the, what happens. Many of the people, therefore, when they heard this saying, said, of a truth, this is the prophet. Then answered them the Pharisees, are you deceived? Have any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed on him? But this people who don't know the law are cursed. These are the Pharisees speaking. But what does the Lord say about them? This is clear back in Jeremiah. The priests did not say, where is the Lord? They didn't even know he was gone. 
just like at the Laodicean church. They that handle the Torah didn't even know me, he says. And Jeremiah 2, look at this. Be astonished, O you heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be ye very desolate, says the Lord, the yod heh vav -Hey. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the what? Fountain of living waters. That was just mentioned in John 7. They've hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Now the day after that last great day of the feast, when he spoke that, the next day is the eighth day, which is known as what? The rejoicing of the Torah, Simchat Torah. On that day particularly, they would rejoice in the law. They would rejoice in the Torah that God had given. But what happens, if you look in your Bible, it was the very next day on Simchat Torah that they tried to kill the adulterous woman. That story in John, you're going to see, was on Simchat Torah. The day of rejoicing is when they were going to kill the adulterous woman, abusing the Torah. In John 8, what does it say? Look at this next verse. Here's how the day began. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again to the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Isn't that just like Deuteronomy we just sat, read? They were all sitting at his feet on this day. And what is he doing? He's fulfilling the scriptures. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman taken in adultery. And when they set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses and the law commanded us that such and such should be stoned. But what do you say? You know, where's the word of the Lord? What do you have to say if you think you're the Lord? Well, what's interesting, in Deuteronomy 19, uh, I won't read this because of lack of time, but basically it says if false witnesses come, what you intended to do to that person is going to be done to you. So in other words, if they're a false witness, the Lord is, you know, you get to be stoned. And in Leviticus 20.10, it says, the law also says that the adulterer and the adulteress shall be put to death. If they were caught in the very act, how come the adulterer wasn't there? So they weren't even following the Torah. They were totally abusing it. Plus, I, I don't remember if I mentioned this to you last week, because I, I speak at the, or the other church too, and I don't remember what I said where. But Josephus and these other books record that during Pilate's era, the great Sanhedrin, there was the chamber of the hewn stone. The elders would always sit at the gates. At the front of the temple was a chamber that, where the great Sanhedrin would sit, and only they could try capital cases that had to do with murder. But because the high priests and all the priests were so wicked, most of them, and they couldn't enforce the law, the court decided it'd be better just to disband and not even have it. If we can't enforce it on the high priest, we can't enforce it on anybody, we better forget it. Therefore, the death penalty was not allowed. And so that's why the Jews told Herod, according to our law, we can't kill him. Because they had stepped out. So when you read about the stoning of the adulterous woman, the stoning of Stephen, that shows you the environment was mob rule. It was total chaos during Christ's time. There was no law and order. That's what that's telling you when you read these stories. So let's look at John chapter 8 now. This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking, he lifted himself up and he said to them, He that is without sin among you, let him cast a first stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Did you ever wonder what he was writing on the ground? Well, look at verse 9 here on your notes. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. They were totally ashamed, weren't they? Now, do you remember just the day before they had rejected the fountain of living waters? Look what Jeremiah says. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all that forsake you shall be ashamed, and they that depart from me shall be written in the earth, because they forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. Isn't that another one of those just really cool verses? And then what does it say on your note? She says, heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved. That's what she was crying out. This verse exactly applies to the, here he is, fulfilling scripture over and over and over again. Hosea 8, 8 through 12. Israel is swallowed up now shall they be among the Gentiles as a vessel wherein is no pleasure. They've gone up to Assyria, wild ass alone by himself. Ephraim's hired lovers. Yea, though they've hired among the nations, now will I gather them, and they shall sorrow a little for the burden of the king of the princes. 
And then it says, because Ephraim has made my altars to sin, altars shall be unto him a sin. I have written to him the great things of my Torah, but they were counted as a strange thing. We should not count Torah as something strange. Hosea 4, 6 says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. How many of you have heard that verse before? But how many of you have kept it in context? Look what it says. Because you've rejected knowledge, I will also reject you. You should be no priest to me, seeing you have forgotten the Torah. That's what they have no knowledge of. It's not knowledge of the sciences or knowledge of the arts or knowledge of music. It's knowledge of Torah. That's why the people are perishing. Leviticus 23, again, say it with me. You shall what? Dwell in booths seven days. All that are Israelites born shall dwell in booths, that your generations may know I am the children of Israel to dwell in booths. There would literally be thousands of sukkahs dotting the hillside for miles around the city. Two and a half million people are in Israel. Thousands of sukkahs all around the city. And look at John 1.14. <clears throat> and the word was made flesh and what? Do you know what the word is there? It's to tabernacle. And the word dwelt there means to tent or encamp as God did in the tabernacle of old. Now when did they begin to build the tabernacle? On the Feast of Tabernacles. And God is going to reside with man as they did in the tabernacle of old. Now let's take a look at Luke. We're going to finish up here pretty quick. Luke 1. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias. How many have heard of him? John the Baptist's daddy. Of the course of Abijah. Most people read that and they have no idea what it's saying. So I'm going to explain that to you here. It says his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth, or Elisheba, which is also Aaron's wife, the first high priest. His wife's name was Elisheba as well. And it says it came to pass that while he did what? Executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. What do you think, that, when was that? What time of the year do you think that was? Have you ever thought about when that was that John the Baptist went in there? You all know the story, he came out, couldn't talk, and everyone knows the story, right? But have you ever thought about what time, what month of the year that happened? You're about to find out. Another one of those really cool things. If you notice in your Bible, it says that it was uh, 1 Chronicles 24. It says, now these are the divisions of the sons of Aaron. The sons of Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, Eleazar and Ithamar, but Nadab and Abihu died before their father and had no children. Therefore, Eleazar and Ithamar did what? Executed the priest's office. There's the verse that ties in what we just read. And there was 24 courses, I told you. And the eighth course went to who? Abijah. That's the guy they were talking about in Luke. And these were the orderings of them in their service when they came to the house of the Lord, according to their manner. And if you notice, they did it according to the manner. So let's look at this calendar here now. <clears throat> Passover is generally April, and that became the first of the month for them on their calendar. So we're going to pretend April 1 is Nisan 1. So there was, they, the priest, how many weeks are in a year? 52. On the Jewish calendar, there's 51. They're slightly different than ours. Okay, that's why you have this rotation. If there's 24 courses and they serve two weeks a year, that's how many weeks? 48. That would leave three weeks left. Well, during the three times a year, they all had to come to Jerusalem, Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. All the priests would minister, and that would cover the whole year, right? They would minister one week, and then they'd minister another week. So they had a long time in between. It's not like two weeks all at once. So here's going to be the first course. Here's the second course. Now here's Passover, the 14th day of Nisan. So this is everybody ministers. So here's the third course. Here's the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh. Here's the eighth course. So here's the week that the course of Abijah would have ministered. But you know what happens this week? It's Pentecost. So all of them are ministering. So Zechariah was ministering during the Feast of Pentecost. That's the event that was going on. Let's look at Luke 1, 10, and 11. Look at this next picture. It says, And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. 
The word multitude in the Greek is, you ever heard of the term plethora? It means a whole bunch. Well, there's another good picture. Uh, plethos literally means a large number, a throng. Why do you think there was this huge multitude there? They had to be there. They had to be there how many times a year? Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. So when you understand this and you're reading this, the whole multitude, it was the Feast of Pentecost. And then in Luke 1.23, it goes on to say, It came to pass as soon as the days of his ministration were accomplished. Okay, he not only had to serve his week, but he had to serve Pentecost. So he was there for two whole weeks, right? He departed to his own house, and after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself five months. So now let's look at the calendar. Here you have, uh, this week was Pentecost. He goes here, in this area here, he and Liz, Elizabeth and him, uh, she conceives. And then she hid herself five months. One, two, three, four, five. That puts, right here is about the fifth month. Everyone with me? Now let's look at Luke 1. In the sixth month, what's the sixth month now? That's the end of December. The angel Gabriel was sent from God to the city of Galilee named Nazareth. And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon you, and the power of the highest shall overshadow you. Therefore, that holy thing shall be born of you, shall be called the Son of God. And behold, your cousin Elizabeth, she's also conceived a son in her old age. And this is what? The sixth month who was called barren. Now, it says Mary abode with her for three months. Why do you think she stayed there for three more months? What's six plus three? How many months do you have a baby? You think she probably stayed there until she had a baby? It's three more months, January, February. That puts John the Baptist being born right around Passover, doesn't it? So, Luke 2. And so it was, while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room in the inn. Now, think about it. Go back to the calendar for a second. If it was here that Mary conceived during the Feast of Hanukkah, you add nine months, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, that puts the Lord being born on the Feast of Tabernacles. He tabernacles among man. Light has come into the world. He was born on Sukkot. Now look at this. Why do you think there was no room in the inn? That's why there was no room in the inn. And they laid him in a manger. The word manger there is a crib to eat out of. Cattles are in sukkahs, and they eat out of cribs. They laid them in a manger. And look at this, the swaddling clothes. It, the swaddling clothes, the word there means to wrap with strips. It was the priestly garments that they used for wicks during the Feast of Tabernacles. He was wrapped in the priestly garments when he was born. They're wrapping him in the garments of the priests. Luke 2, there was in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were so afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you tidings of what? What do they do during the Feast of Tabernacles? Which shall be to all people, for unto you is born what day? In the city of David a what? Which is Christ the Lord. Now, let's look at this next picture. Here's Israel in winter. Let's look at the next one. And the next one. Let's go through the snow pictures. Let them get a good idea of the snow pictures. Okay, now, let me ask you this. Do you think the shepherds are going to be out in the mountainous snow in the middle of winter? Here is Nazareth. Do you notice all the mountains and see Bethlehem? It is 44 miles. As a woman, if you're a great with child nine months pregnant, are you going to want to ride a donkey through mountainous weather in 10 feet of snow through the mountains to get to Bethlehem? You don't even like driving to Seattle in the snow in a car. <laughs> he was not born in the middle of winter. You're not going to see shepherds feeding their sheep in the middle of the snow. Right after the Feast of Tabernacles, they're all taken down to Bethlehem to be put in the sheepfolds. Luke 2, 1, it says, And it came to pass in those days there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. How many of you like the IRS? 
Tell me this, if you were the governor in the IRS, are you going to want to send camel jockeys out in the snow to gather after three months after the harvest? They've had time to hide all their wealth. Or are you going to wait for all of them to come to you in one place with all their money and all their harvests and you can get their census of exactly who's here because they had to be there according to their God? One of the main aspects of the holiday of Sukkot is the biblical commandment, Deuteronomy 16, 14. And you shall rejoice in your feast. You, your son, your daughter, your manservant, your maidservant, the Levite, the stranger, the fatherless, the widow that are within your gates. You know what God said? Talk about a surprise birthday party. He said, I'm going to surprise the world. There will be a party on my son's birthday, and you will sing and rejoice. That's why they were rejoicing. God was just getting them practice. He was teaching them the songs. Here's what you're going to sing. Here's the word. He had David write the songs for his son's birthday a thousand years before he was born. Now look at Psalms 118. Remember what I said about Psalms 118. Psalms 118, even the Jews believe it had to do with the coming of the Messiah. And they would sing these psalms. And look what the words they were singing on that day. The Lord is my strength and my song and has become my Yeshua. The voice of rejoicing. And Yeshua is where? He's in the tabernacles of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I will praise you for you have heard me. And you have become my Yeshua on the Feast of Tabernacles. Psalms 118, it goes on to say, this is the day which the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And then they would all yell in the temple, save now, save now. That's what they were yelling. And you can see why then in Luke 2.13, it says, suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God. They were just saying, oh God, you are too much. I could just see them now. They're praising God. And here they're looking down from the outer space into the world and they see light coming out out of the world and they see all these people worshiping and praising and they don't even realize what they're doing well what does it say in luke 2 21 when the eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child his name was yeshua which was so named the angel before he was conceived in the womb on the eighth day of sukkot here he is shedding his blood in the temple confirming the covenant to abraham that could only happen during sukkot and then we'll close with these two verses. Luke 2, 22 through 24. And when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Do you know that is ex not exactly what it says? I'm going to show you. Think about this. She brought either a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons, Right? Well, look what it really says in Leviticus 12. It's quoting this verse. When the days of her purifying are fulfilled for son or for daughter, she shall bring a lamb of the first year. But what happens if they can't afford a lamb? They were to bring a lamb of the first year for the burnt offering and then a young pigeon or a turtle dove for a sin offering under the door of the tabernacle of the congregation to the priest. But if she's not able to bring a lamb, she's too poor, then she can bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons. So that tells you that they were not a wealthy family. And you can imagine if you were Mary and this angel had just appeared to you and great things were happening. Don't you wish you could have afforded a lamb? She had a lamb. She had the lamb of God. Amen. Thank you.